Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar. My name is Nicholas Graham. I'm the Managing Director of Safety Risk Management Consultants, and we regularly engage with colleagues and other professionals to understand their experience, their wisdom, and them sharing their tools and techniques to help you to improve your business. <clears throat> this afternoon, I'm meeting with a very, very good friend of mine, Mr. Jan Fasahi. Um, our families have known each other for quite some time. I'm, I'm not gonna take away from any of uh, Jan's thunder and I'll give him an opportunity to introduce himself. But suffice it to say, Jan and I have probably had a half an hour discussion this afternoon before the webinar started. And I have to say, I'm really, really excited for what Jan is gonna share with us this afternoon. Um, the level of experience that Jan has got and I believe what he brings to the table, I think would be very helpful to many businesses. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Jan Fasaki. Thank you, Nick. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Uh, um, but just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Jan Vasaki, and you're probably wondering, whoa, an Engel spreken to Vasaki, but uh, <laughs> the explanation is quite simple. My middle name is George, and uh, my mom was English, my dad was Afrikaans, and we grew up in the Durban area. So I'm a product of the greater Durban area. Um, through Glenwood High School onto Natal Varsity. We won't hold Glenwood against uh, no, you. No, you won't hold Glenwood against you. Um, and then from there, just getting involved in industry. And I was very blessed that uh, at one stage I thought that I would become a lecturer. And I, was, I realized once I'd started walking that road that um, industry had, was very attractive. And uh, I was very blessed to be able to get a position at the old Turner and Newell organization at the British Industrial Plastics in mm -hmm. my time. And I got introduced because I'd done uh, biological studies. And I got introduced to um, chemistry, applied chemistry in, in a field of, of composites. And then I had an expert working as a scientist in, in industry all the way through into management. Um, I ended up at, at Ferodo who make friction materials. Um, and that was my introduction to lean actually, um, was through Toyota. And that's where Lean actually started. It was with the Toyota. I mean, if you go back in history, we spoke about the Toyota production system. Sure. Um, we spoke about uh, getting involved with um, quality circles and things like that. And everything grew from that. So throughout my working career, um, I've been involved with uh, change management, um, manufacturing in, in the chemical industry, automotive industry, and more recently in, in the clothing and textile uh, cluster, <clears throat> but always from a perspective of trying to understand how, what is it that we do that provides value to the organization. Yeah. And, and that's crucial. And in terms of my experience base within the organization, all the way from shop floor when I started to a senior executive level, um, I was responsible for all our original equipment business, um, in, within South Africa, uh, while at Froda, and then also for international exports to the likes of Baton Prize or for people like that. And then I ran uh, DACE component manufacturers um, and involved in the heavy engineering. Well, I'm not an engineer, I'm a mm. scientist. <clears throat> so uh, part of who I am as a person and what, and, and what makes me tick is a desire to be able to talk to the whole organization. Right. from shop floor to MD. Sure. And actually understand what it is that's, that needs assistance in terms of creating value for the customer. Sure, sure. So I was walking around the dam where I lived the other day and I bumped into Jan and I said, Jan, um, you know, so many businesses are floundering at the moment. They're trying to uh, rise like a phoenix from the ashes, so to say. And I said, if, if you had to say, or share your wisdom with any business at the moment, what, what would you say to them? And Jan's reply to me was, we need to learn to focus and listen to the customer again. And I was, I was really intrigued by what that meant to Jan, which really kind of brought about this discussion and this webinar this afternoon. And uh, I've asked Jan to, to share his wisdom. So he's put together a, a slide presentation, which he's gonna take you through. We'll take some, some questions at the end, but I'm really, really interested to, to listen to uh, what Jan has got to share. We'll uh, bring up the, um, the presentation and we will get going in 
on second. So let's just go back to the beginning. Okay, Jan. It's all it's up to me. Go for right, it. guys. Well, I hope you enjoy this. So as Nick was saying, um, it's about the voice of the customer. And, and, I, and he said, well, what times? Well, I thought, well, maybe I'll put a presentation together entitled Lean and COVID Times. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all involved with a changing environment, which has never changed as much as it has. And on such a global scale, simultaneously, I don't think the world sure. has ever experienced this. No. I mean, this is absolutely staggering in terms of what has happened to everybody absolutely. simultaneously. And it, it, it's, it's had an effect which which has almost disconnected business at, at its heart because it's prevented people from actually working together. Sure. Now, my, my background is, is mainly manufacturing. So in terms of experience, the service industry that I've been exposed to has been more from the perspective of saying what happens to how do we get information about the product that the customer wants to buy and how do we actually then create the, the value so that I can get the product once it's finished to the customer. And that would be those two parts of the supply chain would be seen as service. Sure. Um, but it's interesting in, in these times is that that part of the organization has been able to disconnect quite easily and work from home. But when you're making a product, unfortunately, it has to be in the factory. So when I look back at COVID times, what it's done for all of us, it's actually caused a giant rethink globally, yeah. immediately on, on every front. So I, that's why I entitled it uh, Lean and COVID Times. So the first thing that entered my brain was to say, well, when you're faced with uncertainty to the extent that we are at the moment, the last thing we want is to create a whole lot of new jargon, uh, toolkits, and fancy terms. What we really need to get to grips with is the very heart of what business is about. And that how do I create value to the point where I can persuade a customer at the end of the, of the value chain to actually part with his precious cash? And in this environment, that precious cash is actually very precious to everyone very because true. everyone is taking this now. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to do in this talk is I'm not going to be using jargon. I'm going to try and just use everyday language to discuss what lean is actually all about. So the question that prefaced that little discussion was, well, why do we tend to make life so complicated? Maybe yeah. we want to feed our own ego sometimes and try and be more important than we are. Very true. So what I'll take you through is basically the simplicity of lean thinking. Um, and against that backdrop a little bit uh, about the uncertainty of COVID times. And then whose voice do I listen to? And then from there, how do we maximize value? And then how do we minimize waste? And the last two comments actually work hand in glove. You can't separate them. Sure. Sorry. Go for it. Right. So when we talk about lean, um, we need to understand its background, where it started from. It actually started in the automotive industry uh, within Toyota of all places. And it was the understanding that it's not management on their own who create value for the customer. It's everybody together. And if we are going to continuously satisfy the customer, and remember this is the Japanese coming out of World War II, sure. they needed to build industries where they could then get their economy going. Sure. And uh, the one which rose the quickest was in fact the automotive industry. And they were in, in competition with the giants of the world, especially in America, Ford, Ford and people like that. And they, they cottoned on very quickly to say, I need everybody involved in understanding who the customer is. Let's understand his requirements and then let's together create value. And the system grew from there. And uh, terms like just-in-time production were introduced. Uh, and then it was the Japanese way. And it's all ended up as to where we are with Lean today. And in fact, people now talk about Lean Six Sigma and, and Ford Six Sigma. It's all about manufacturing techniques and the way in which we we take raw materials and in 
a structured way using best practice create value that someone is prepared to part with their cash. Sure. So on the screen is you, you see three little flags. One's green, one's uh, yellow, and one is red. Uh, and, and they're quite intuitive. Green means go. <laughs> and, and, and quite frankly, the, the green is, are those clearly value-added activities which we need to engage ourselves in, or whatever our industry is, mm. in providing value for the customer. Sure. Then we, we encounter uh, things that we're not quite sure about, like caution. It's about you know, you're traveling along on the freeway and you say, oh, no, here we go. There's a traffic light ahead. I better start slowing down. And I'm not sure the light's green. Will I make it? Yeah. Uh, and then it turns to caution, which is a flag to say to you, well, oh, yeah, hang on, it's nearly time to stop. And in industry, in our value-adding activity, we have exactly the same situation. When things are going well and, and, and value is flowing, it's green. Yeah, yeah. And, but every now and again, we encounter situations where we're not quite sure, and that's where we need some caution. Um, and then clearly, if it's a red, it means stop. Yeah. Uh, the bad thing about stop is that we have all the elements of the opposite of creating value for the customer, engaging ourselves. So sure. in our heads, what we need to understand is that green activity adds value for the customer. The yellow or, or cautionary uh, activity, <clears throat> which consumes resources and don't, doesn't directly contribute to the product or service we're providing, but they actually are required. Uh, they tend to be legal requirements or risk management or regulation that requirements. Orange? That's that orange, orange or yellow in the slide. I don't know what your screen <laughs> yeah, is yeah. showing. Me. Those are the necessary things which we need to do. Uh, and we need to hold them in tension because sometimes they get in the way of creating value, but we mm. still have to do them. And then those are the things that are clearly stopping the flow of added value. Okay. And the challenge of lean, in fact, the whole role of lean is to maximize the green. Okay. So in ordinary layman's language, what is lean manufacturing? It's about satisfying the customer with green activity. Sure. It's as simple as that. Sure. So let's just talk about uncertainty. I don't know about um, how you've experienced it, Nick, but mm. after about day seven of the lockdown, I just did a mental freeze. Yeah. I just could not keep up with my cell phone and the WhatsApp messages yeah. and everything that's going on. And the barrage is unrelenting. Yeah, the different opinions. Huge opinions. I mean, it's going on all the time. And who do you trust? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, what you need to do is you've got to make decisions in the, in the face of uncertainty. And the decisions you make are affecting your lives and the lives of other people. Mm. And you're trying to actually sift the good from the bad. In a way, that's like lean. What is it that's going to add value to society in terms of what can I do positively myself to constitute? And I'm now putting myself in the area of the shop floor. Sure. I'm a shop floor person in the COVID reality. <clears throat> and I'm trying to do things which is enabling the experts, middle management and management, which is the medical fraternity and the yeah. epidemiologists, who are the experts in these fields, to actually stop this blast. Yeah, yeah. So I now need to understand what's going on so that I can make a contribution. Yeah. And the barrage, and the, who do you believe? Who do you trust? Um, I want to listen well, don't I? Yeah, definitely. I want to listen well. And the, some of the things um, you can take offense to mm. because it, we get told to do things, and sometimes I say to myself, well, right. wow. Not logical. I, I don't know about that one. But is that an opportunity to say, hey, wow. Um, that means I've, if I'm doing this, I'm actually honoring somebody else and, and, and creating it. And I quite jokingly said to some of the guys at church when, when we locked down, I said, well, do you realize we'll be coming back to the service last? It's yeah. my age group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we're the most at risk. No, no, no. No, so think about it. Yeah. So we're going to have to support everybody else in terms of what's going on within the community. Yeah. And enable you to do what you can because you're at a lower risk. So if I insist on coming to the church service yeah. with social distancing, I'm putting pressure on you unnecessarily. Absolutely. So I need to, we need to actually understand what's yeah. going on and yeah. say, hey guys, maybe not. So that's the opportunity to understand what the added value is. Using the, the, the religious point we're talking yeah. about, the yeah. value added point is hearing God's voice and making mm -hmm. tomorrow different to today against his kingdom principles. Yeah. So what we're doing with that, the opportunity I saw was to say, let's not get in the way of that. Yeah. By now getting so 
distracted on everything else that's going sure. on. We can sure. actually stay out of the way. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we're not in contact with them. Yeah. yeah. We still are. Yeah. So when the last comment on the slide, well, it's up to me. So it always comes back to the individual. What is it that I do in my own decision making, which enables me to contribute to that value going forward? So that's the, the backdrop to the uncertainty. And uh, a quote from Peter, Peter Drucker, uh, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. <laughs> <laughs> so when we, when we listen to the customer, we need to understand at the heart of Lean is that value is defined by the customer, no one else. <clears throat> the person who actually lets go of hand and wallet, credit card out, Tap and go now in COVID times, yeah. not put in, yeah. you know, have you got a tap and go machine? Yeah. Tap and go yeah. so that you part with my hard-earned cash. Yeah. I'm actually the customer at that point. And that cash transaction supports all the value adding going all the way down the chain to sure. the very people involved with raw material production. And we need to listen to each other along the way because we need to create value for each other in in. <clears throat> in a way which enables me to take that input and add my value to it so that I can continue down the chain of building the value offering yeah. to the point where a cash transaction happens. Yeah. So where you are in the value chain in terms of different industries, because we have raw material manufacturers and we have beneficiators and then mm -hmm. we have the retail sector, everyone's involved in a single cash transaction, the one that buys the product. Yeah. Getting into but, but we play a role all the way along the line and we need to honor everybody in those steps mm. to create an environment where they can continue focusing on green activity. If we're doing things along the way, we're inadvertently, we haven't listened correctly yeah. and we do what we think is clever without yeah. checking, yeah. we might be creating a red zone yeah. or an orange zone and yeah. we don't even know it. So just refresh our memory again. Green activity is the value added, added, value added to the customer. Value added, clear. There's no question about it. That's going to create customer satisfaction in the cash transaction. And ching ching. Ching ching. Right. And that's what lean is about. How do I do that? How do I take everybody with me along the way? So it's about listening. So it's the way we listen that's important. Because what we tend to do, and this is something that I wrestle with at my age, is that because of my experience base, the last thing I want to do is go into a situation and say, well, I've seen this. This is actually, and I jump to conclusions about what it is. So it's not about freeing the brain. It's mm. actually about removing the cage around my ability to perceive mm. the flow of value and the blockages, which is the yellow and, and, and the red. And if we look carefully at the picture, you'll see the person. What we tend to do when we rely on experience is we disappear into our brains. And we're going back into the past. We no longer see with our eyes. We no longer hear well mm. who we're talking to. Sure. We're jumping to conclusions. We're no longer tasting and seeing what's good. We're lost in our thoughts coming up mm. with a solution to what we thought we saw. Mm. And that's the biggest danger we all have. Yeah. We need to continuously get rid of the cage so that we're always aware of what the voice of the customer is in terms of what is value adding mm. and being able to remove those things which are getting in the way yeah. of creating that, including my own perceptions and experience. So what we do when we go into an area is we actually go in with eyes wide open and we are looking for not efficiency. We're looking for what are the blockages? What is the yellow and, and what is the red? What's getting in the way of the flow of value to the customer? And, we, and, and the challenge is to then get involved with that. So basic building block, um, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, there are eight wastes. There are eight, eight things that are classed as yellow, orange, and red, okay. which are barriers to the flow okay. of value. Um, overproduction, well, I like to talk about Tim Woods, okay, because it's then very easy to interest. T is for transport, moving things unnecessary. Sure. Eyes for inventory, big problem. Inventory is stock. Yeah. It's a pile of stuff that's waiting to move. Well, why? It's bad news. Some of, some of the wastes are bigger than others. So I've, I've stressed eyes, a big, it's a big baddie okay. because a number of the other wastes mm -hmm. cause that. So then the M, M is for motion, movement of people. Okay. So transport is movement of goods or products sure. or services. And M is the movement of people associated sure. with that. Yeah. And then the next one is waiting. Well, yeah. machines can wait, processes can wait, 
Services can wait. I can wait. Yeah, if I suddenly wait. stop talking, everyone watching the webinar, guess what? They're going to be waiting. Yeah. So that's waiting. Clear. Easy to yeah. understand. Uh, the two O's, which are like glasses, one is overproduction, uh, where, where, where I'm deliberately, I'm not sure about what's going on, so I'm going to make a whole lot of stuff just in case. Or I'm going to do a whole lot of things just in case. Okay. And that's where Toyota came up with the just in time. Okay. Okay. That's where that came from. They said, well, how do I yeah. remove that inventory? How do I stop this thinking, all these thinking processes that are blocking the flow? Yeah. So they spoke about, well, let's do it just in time, one at a time. So that's overproduction, doing far more than the sure. Supply. And then overprocessing is an interesting <clears throat> one because there you've got a challenge where you yourself in your industry have intimate knowledge, which the customer may not have. So what you do sometimes is you add in things that you think the customer needs because you've always done it that way and that's your current best practice. Sure. So we, it's called overprocessing. But at the end of the day, he may not necessarily be prepared to pay for that. Right. Right. But you think you need to do it because you think you're adding value for it. You need to check with them to see whether, in fact, that's actually required. And that's overprocessing. Then the D is quite simple. It's defects. Something's okay. gone yeah. wrong. Non-conformity. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love the fact <clears throat> that uh, in Tim Woods, the final thing we come to, and generally uh, things that happen last tend to be the most important. Um, it's about skills, the way we think, the way we engage with people. And it's not last but not least. It's actually last because it's the most important. And the challenge within all of these things within Lean is how do I actually take the skills base of everybody within the organization from the shop floor to the senior exec to the MD to the owner of the business and get them to understand that the enemy is not within the organization. Sure. The, your enemy is you've got to get the order instead of somebody else. And how do I take everybody in my family with me? Yeah. And the quicker we start thinking about the organization as your personal family, we create an, an environment wherein everybody can make a contribution. Sure. And we'll get onto that. In a moment. That's great. So those are the eight quests. And if you've forgotten who, who it is, it's Tim Woods. Woods. Right, so just a reminder from someone within Toyota again, I love these guys. We must always keep in mind that the greatest waste is the waste we don't see. And that was the perception thing I spoke about earlier sure. and experience because we go in and we Maybe. think we know what the solution is. We've jumped to conclusions. Whoa, stop. And there are two tricks that I want to talk about here. Um, <coughs> Kaichi Ono was the father of Lean. And what he used to do at Toyota is he would go into an area and he would stop and then draw a chalk circle around himself. And that was a signal to everybody in that area where people were work, working was that he was deliberately there not to check on them to see whether they're being efficient. He was actually looking for the waste. Okay. So what I do to myself as a reminder is I've been blessed. I don't need glasses. Yeah. But I deliberately, when I go to a new client for the first time, as I put on my lean glasses, it's a reminder to myself to say, it's not about experience. You've got to be able to use all your senses to see the flow of value and the blockages. What's getting in the way of that? So those mental tricks keep us going to where we need to be. Sorry, it's frozen. Right, so skills, leadership in lean COVID times. So if we look at this, we talk about how do we create an organization which is like a family where everybody believes they can make a contribution and actually create mm. value for the mm. customer. Um, the biggest challenge of the owner of the business or the CEO is that he needs to understand that, or she needs to understand that they on their own. How do I take people with me? How do I get into the hearts and minds of everybody that's out there and create a climate where everyone understands that I can create value? Um, and when we look at all the policy manuals and ISO and the rest of it, they're, they're, it's like a toolkit. Yeah. And we say, okay, well, if I do this, it should work. Mm, unfortunately, it doesn't always work. Yeah. Because that tends to be a, uh, here's a checklist, fill it in. I've done it. I've ticked all the boxes. We're doing the doing. But do you know what? Don't do what I, don't do what I say I do. Do what I actually do is how yeah. people live their lives. Sure. 
And we need to understand that when we honor people, when we honor people for the role in which they create value, whether it's a shop floor person mm. or whether it's someone in HR or someone processing orders in the office, they are all honoring the same cash transaction, which means someone's prepared to pay for it. Mm. And if we can get all of their hearts and minds mm. involved with that, yeah. that's true leadership. Okay. And creating an environment where they're able to do that. And if you go back in time, some of the tools that have been applied to this is uh, many years ago, people spoke about quality circles. Sure. Um, and then in more recent times, and it came from within the automotive industry, and we, quality circles became mission-directed work teams. And, and that's a truly South African export, powerful product. Sure. But basically, it's small groups of people within an work environment who work together, who understand what their value-creating activity is, mm -hmm. and how do I do that ongoingly with my colleagues in this area to actually honor the customer and create value for them? Okay. And understanding that no one person has all the answers. So you need to be very careful with the type of people you put in authority, because if they say, I'm an authority because I know it all, you, you need to change that mindset to, I'm an authority because I'm here to help people. I'm here to become a coach. I'm here to be able to set people free to get them to see what's getting in the way of the creation of values so that I can stand <coughs> alongside that person and improve their best practice. That's excellent. Right? So that, the, that they're actually contributing the to culture the creation. Value. Culture creation. That's absolutely essential. And the culture creation comes from, from the person who owns the business yeah. because they set the example. Absolutely. Yeah. And remember that one, one angry word builds a fire that takes a long time to extinguish. We have yep. to be so. Going back to that other slide where I said, you know, we need to be careful in any situation. The last thing we want to do is someone might inadvertently say something which offends you. It only becomes an offense when you take it and internalize it. So keep it at a distance what's going on and don't internalize something until you're sure you understand. Because yeah. far too often, what we do is we take offense and then it explodes. Yeah. Don't take it. Leave it out there as being uncertain. And we need to spend more time yeah. understanding what's going on. Right. So how do I make tomorrow different to today? How do I make sure that that flow of value is happening for the customer through my particular organization? I've got everybody involved and now I've got ISO 9000. I'm doing all these standards. I've got them right and we're auditing and we're doing this and we're doing exactly the same thing and we focused on it. And guess what? My audit's clean. I've got no findings. Fantastic. Whoopsie. Are you listening to the customer? Things yeah. might have changed. And unfortunately, this whole area of systems and audits and that is in the orange area, the yellow yeah. area, because it's setting what they think is best practice and training auditors to audit against that so that you can ultimately say that to the person out there, hey, look, I'm using best practice to make your, your yeah. item. Yeah. But the world is changing. And by the, by the by its very definition, bureaucracy is something that doesn't change easy. Yeah. So if we say, okay, well, Jan, don't take offense by the word bureaucracy. What do you mean? Well, <clears throat> if I've put something in place in a certain way, so let, 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 let's do it this way. Let's talk about sorting the added value activities that I'm responsible for from the non-valuating activity. Sure. That's the first step. <clears throat> then I set things in order because I want to actually be able to repeatedly do the, what's creating value. Yeah. Then, if that's right, let's check it to see that it's right, that it's happening all the time. Mm. Then I can say, that's my standard. And now we're in the realm of your business, <clears throat> your standards and procedures, yeah. and are you doing it? Yeah. But we lose sight of the fact, the first two steps. Yeah. And then what we do afterwards, after standardizing, mm. we sustain. But what do we say? Are we sustaining a standard that's staying the same? Or are we recognizing the fact that the customer is actually changing? Yeah. And he's never changed as quickly as he is now. We don't understand how fast the world is changing at the moment yeah. as a result of COVID. Take, for example, the, what, what I spoke about, about office people and manufacturing people. Guess what? If you're in the pro property industry right now yeah. and, and you are providing mm -hmm. offices, you don't need to work in an office, guy. No. You can add that value at home. Yeah. The challenge for the CEO in the manufacturing is how do I work at home, but how do I still get the hearts and minds of people on the shop floor? You've yeah. got to go walk about yourself. You've got to understand who people are, who their families are. You actually need to understand what they're doing yourself 
Absolutely. by walking through plants and the rest of it yeah. and actually engaging with people who create the value that you are using to supply others. So COVID times, very, very interesting. So Albert Einstein, well known for his energy equation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but basically, and I love this, he said, insanity is the definition for doing the same thing over and over again and expecting Sorry. and expecting different results. Guess what? If you do the same thing every time, tomorrow is going to be the same as today. Yeah. You have to know what is it that I'm going to do differently to make tomorrow to today. Yeah. And it's not saying, is my standard right? I've got to do more of that standard. It's actually questioning where the standard comes from sometimes and saying, has things changed? What can I do to alter that standard? What do I need to set in order? And that's the process of lean, which is Kaizen, the Japanese word for continuous improvement. So it's a continuous process. It's a thinking process. It's about looking at the non-value red activity, which and, is the pure waste, and yeah. the non-value add. Notice I'm saying, how do, I, how do I satisfy the customer better? I don't work harder. I don't chase the score. I actually understand the voice of the customer, what's valuable to him, yeah. and I actually focus my time, as tough as it is, on what's getting in the way of that flow. The yellow, orange things, the red things. Yeah. Am I seeing them? Are we all so busy now that we've come mm. back to work that we mm. lose sight of the fact that we might be silly busy? Yeah, and that, that seems to have become the definition of success for many people. It's like, oh, how are you doing? I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You get home at the end of the day and you say, wow, I had a fantastic day. Yeah. I, I got the product out. I met my target. But you, it was hard work. But guess what? I was the hero. I won. I got it there. Yeah. Whoops. If that's your supervisor... You're not helping anybody <clears throat> because at the end of the day, you're going to burn up, you're going to burn out, you're going to blow up. Sure. So it's about getting other people involved with dealing with the challenges that you've dealt with. And the thing is, when you do it personally as a hero, you are not leaving in place a new standard for people. You haven't concentrated on coaching people to the new best standard. You've just tried to fix the problem yourself. Right. So you've got to create that environment where everybody understands what the new best practice is. How can I actually do that? Coaching. Ongoingly, coaching. So the role of management changes along the way. I'm losing track of time. Nick. You're going to help me out. Stress. Go for it. Right. So here's your a classic supply chain from uh, one, one position in the organi single organization. So uh, we need to understand that things don't happen in silos. Um, they, they may appear that way if you're involved in a, a man, you say it's manufacturing and you've got a press shop and a paint shop and, a, and you walk through walls and that. But that's actually not a true picture of what's going on. Sure. You actually are taking something with a, a low level of sophistication and you're increasing it. And it's moving through all these things to the point at which it reaches the end of the manufacturing process. Sure. And then you give that to that part of your organization, which is getting to the customer. Sure. So the customer need has yep. a voice. Yep. Am I listening properly? Uh, and he might be saying, look, I want a blue car or I want this particular model. Have, have mm -hmm. you got mm -hmm. it? <clears throat> so it's customer calls, requests for quotes, orders. Is it a repeat order? Getting involved with sales. Then the fulfillment part is making it. How do I get it there? And then the service part of the organization is getting it to the customer. Right. And we need to listen to everybody along the way. There are, within that, within the organization itself, are many customer supply relationships. Internal customers. Internal customers where you, and the, everything we've been talking about lean is valid for every one of those transactions. Sure. We have to. And, and, the, and, and the best way to sift the, the wheat from the chaff in that is to actually say, am I honoring the next person in the process? Have I used everything in my ability, given my accountability <clears throat> and responsibility where I am, mm. to have honored the next step by giving them the best I can? Sure. And that's the best practice. Okay. And at the end of this, we've got, so we listen to customer needs right at the beginning, and then the satisfied customer is listening to that as well. Yeah. And he sees that in the organization because he's, I like dealing with that organization yeah. because they're not telling me how good they are. They're showing me. They're giving me what I need on time in full. Oh, yeah. And they're asking the right questions of me. 
Now, within the clothing sector, we have been intimately involved mm. the last three or four years. Unfortunately, the power balance is wrong. Okay. So, unfortunately, the retailers tend to abuse the manufacturers. Correct. And the challenge of the clothing cl sector is to actually restore honor amongst all the different positions within it's every, everybody needs everybody else. It's and how do we actually do this? Are we listening to each other? Because at the end of the day in South Africa, the enemy is imports. Yeah. It's about local yeah. jobs. Yeah. So how can we work <clears throat> together to actually drive out the waste, mm. to leave pure value so yeah. that we are competitive? Yeah. That's so good. How do we That's do that? very good. Right. So a lot of talk from me. My voice tells me <clears throat> that it, I've been going on a long time. <laughs> probably saying, Yanni, you're the guy on the right. Stop shouting. <laughs> I've heard you. But unfortunately, we need hearing aids. Okay. I need a hearing aid. I need to learn to listen better. Because if I get caught up in a crusade and I'm just pumping my message all the time, I'm no longer listening to the people who are the customers. And I need to honor them as well. They're important. Mm. I'm so involved with telling them what I think they should hear. I also need to pause and say, hey, guys, give me some feedback. How are we doing? I'm teeing up our question and answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've already, <laughs> I've already got a question. <laughs> How did we get there? What is it we're doing? And uh, really, we're all in this together. So I, I love this slide because what I see, um, and I ask the question, what do people see? Oh, well, Nick, what do you see there? The cat stands out. Well, the cat stands out. But yeah. what, is, what about the cat's team? I mean, it's he's team, man. Team, it's yeah. team, lad. And guess what? It's all cats. Some are mere cats and other cats. Uh, other cats. Yeah. So isn't that a bit of a picture of South Africa? Yeah. yeah. Well, very true. And how do we actually all get on board? And hats off to Cyril. Yeah, absolutely. Hats off to absolutely. Cyril. He stood up from amongst the rest, which is against policy because they don't like it. And what we do right now is we try to actually say to everyone, it doesn't matter whether you're EFF, whether you're the DA, it's not we're about focus. This. We're all in this together. Yeah. It's about South Africa, understanding its role, creating value for all of our citizens going forward. In the business all context, how do I get everybody on my shop floor? It doesn't matter where you come from, what you experience, yeah. but how do I honor you so that you actually are with me? And guess what all these guys are looking for? The next opportunity on its way. Yeah. I'm looking for it. Why? Because we can work together and get it sorted. Well, guys, that was fun. That was uh, that was outstanding. That's that was outstanding. That's us. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm just going to end the presentation. Okay, I'm just going to put that down, and we're now going to restore this. And right, I'm just trying to think of how to bring that back. Um, no. And nope. Don't worry, Nick. Right. So anyway, Renell, um, you were asking a question. Uh, I just want to bring up the rest of that screen. Could you, uh, where is the chat? Sorry, because we chat. There it is. Okay. Could you please let Paul in? I was in the waiting room. Sorry, we only got that now. Uh, but we will, okay. we will make a um, recording of the presentation available. Um, Renell, do, um, do you have any questions for, for Jan? Anything that you'd like him to, to answer? Could you... Uh, we don't, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, we, got yeah, no we, can't, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Is your speaker on? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, it's very interesting, this whole process, yeah. you know, that while we're waiting for you to type. Sure. Um, and, and it's a field which has kept me young at heart sure. going forward. Because w when I retired, I said to myself, well, mm. what is it now in the season ahead? And chatting to you know, people in our home group in the same sure, situation, sure. coming to the rest of it. We all said, the thing we all need to do is remain significant. And, and are you doing something that is giving a return from a heart perspective? Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what I'd love to do is help people create value. 
Sure. It's not about making money. It's about helping people understand how they create value. <clears throat> because we're in this together here in this country. Sure. And what a privilege and an honor to be part of this society. Yeah. Where when we reflect God's kingdom in terms of honoring people and how we treat each other, how we can collectively sure. create value and actually say, <clears throat> that, you know, the world doesn't have to be this horrible place that everybody says it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first question I have for you is this. So I'm a communicator. I'm a trainer. I'm a teacher. I, I lecture a lot and I, I, I tell people a lot of things. What, the biggest thing that I've taken away from this is I'm, I'm constantly being, being reminded by people that I need to learn to listen. So I take away two things is that, that imperative to stop and listen. But I think it also, it also imbibes a humility because what I've taken away is your lean glasses that you, that mm -hmm. you put on is you're always learning and always listening because there's mm -hmm. two key kind of things that I've taken away. It's, it's those two things. What, how does a person develop that discipline of, of listening? What underpins it? What drives it? What motivates you to listen? Because I, I need help. I need learning. I need to learn how to imbibe that discipline of listening more to the customer, not having the lenses on and telling them what I think they need to hear. But how do I listen more? Well, you've just framed something that I've wrestled with my whole life. Okay. Listening. Okay. So it's not just And me. it never stops. It's not just you. <laughs> it's not just you. Because the art of listening is listening to those things that don't become offenses. Listening to the things which enable you to create value through a situation where you are honoring the person that you're listening to or yeah. the process. Yeah. So that you're creating an environment so that you can better understand it. Okay. And, and there's no tricks to it. Mm. It's a hard grind. Yeah. The thing, well, you said, well, some tips. Hmm. when I leave an organization, it doesn't matter where it is. When I get into my car and I settle in and I'm getting ready to go and I check my rear view mirror and I look at myself in the rear view mirror and I say, Jan, did you add value today? Did you listen? Hmm. Yeah. And when I'm shaving in the morning, I look in the mirror and I say, you, you can listen. You are able to add value today. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's definitely going to be one so of So those tips are, are the things I use. Um, but it's not easy, Nick. Yeah. It's not easy. It's something we wrestle with all the way. And, and it's not just listening. It's being able to see correctly. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's coming. What, if a way, if I could, uh, could re-express your question to me, is how do I deal with keeping my experience valuable? Sure. So Which it is. It is, it is, but it, it, it can lose its value yeah, and lean it can blind if, you. It, if it blinds you and you no longer see yeah. and you no longer listen. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That, so you need to keep that tension going all the way. Yeah, it's been very rich for me. So, Renell's question, I no, uh, took some photos of the slides. Um, where, are you happy that I... Yes, I, sure I, so. I will happily uh, share the slide deck with you, Renell. I'll, I'll email it to you with the greatest of pleasure. If you had to give kind of a one minute summary, so there's a, a business out there who's been listening to this one, um, how can you help businesses, you as an individual? And then if you had to say, so the key elements to a business owner at the moment, trying to resurrect their business out of COVID, what would it be? I'd say beware the trap of saying, I've got to do whatever it takes just to actually get the customer. Okay. Why do you say that? because you, that will force you not to honor everybody in your organization. It's going to drive you down the efficiency, getting the value out. Okay. So you need to understand, say, hey, we're all in this together. Guys, we understand. You might say, oh, that's slowing me down. No, it's going to make you faster and better. Okay. Can I take everybody with me? Okay. It's all about leadership now. Sure. How can I lead everybody in my organization to the customer and those people in my organization that I'm trusting to hear, for them to hear correctly, mm. am I creating an environment where they are hearing? And can I listen to all the voices? Because that's the way I'm actually going to satisfy the new value. Sure. That's what I would say is the big challenge right now. And in a way, it's actually the challenge on any lean journey. It yeah. always starts there. But it's more important now than anything else. The, the problem we've got is that I, I think the world is changing so much that the customer himself is confused. 
yeah, in terms of what's going on. Well, once we're finished here, that's the next question I had for you. So yeah. I, I want you to try and define for me who this customer is because it's, it, it, it seems like quite a quasi kind of uh, philosophy. But I, once we're finished up here, who knows, maybe that's another webinar. Who, who's, who who's the customer? Who knows, who's the but, customer? Um, but I mean, just to put that in perspective, so if you're in the construction industry, yeah. the customer is the, is, the, is, the, is the person who provided the finance to enable that company to sell those units of construction okay. to someone who raises a bond that pays you cash <clears> for or whatever. So it's not the no. end user, or it is the end no, user that as, is well. A, as well. Because okay. remember, right. there's a chain of events here. Yes. And you need to enable everybody along the way of the chain of events to actually tell the other person sure. to, to sure. part with their hard end and hard end. Really right. good. So in, in, in this time right now, uh, the voice of the customer is the person that, that is, is supplying the cash that supports everything. And, and I'd like you to leave you with uh, an, an MBA in, in, in three, mm. three phrases. This comes from Bill Cooper. Okay. He was our MD at Frodo. Um, many years back. He's a chemical engineer and he went through, he became CEO of Drawbar Group. But he said, he coined the following mantra, um, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash flow is reality. <laughs> it's all about those. Yeah. But you need to put the, the, the customer in there to say, well, the, the, the customer actually underpins all of that. Yeah, how, how do I go? So in terms of COVID times, mm -hmm. being able to sort um, rumor from reality and engaging with the customer well to make sure you understand their value requirement right now. Mm -hmm. Don't just assume <clears throat> that uh, he wants more of the same. He may not. Sure. Tomorrow's only going to be different and, and tomorrow is different to today rapidly. At the yeah, moment. absolutely. So help you, you, you say to him, hey, I'm with you on this journey. We're both not sure, but I'll do my best to actually help them do what you need yeah. to do. Excellent. Jan, thank, thank you, sir. You. Thank you for your time. Absolutely outstanding. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this will be one of, of many interactions, either that I'm coming around to your house.